Hey, welcome to Simple Faith. Great to have you with us. Today, we have a returning guest with us. It's baseball season, so we thought we'd bring back one of our favorite scouts. We've had a few on the show before, but Kevin Burrell always brings the good stuff to us. Here's a guy that works in a great industry that is high-powered, but also filled with a lot of guys that are realizing they've searched and searched for success in one area, only to find it doesn't fully satisfy So whether you like baseball or not, I know you're going to get something out of what Kevin has to say, because what do you do when you're helping coach people or maybe just lead your own family or kids and they're pursuing one thing, but you know it's not going to bring them the fulfillment that they want? How do you help people in that? How do you help yourself in that? Kevin's going to be so helpful to us in understanding that. So excited to have back to the show my friend Kevin Burrell. Hey, everybody. Before we jump into the podcast, I want to let you know about something we're very excited about, and that is a brand new book we have coming out called Friend of God, Letting Jesus Say Who You Really Are. I'm excited about this for a variety of reasons, but one is because I wrote it so guys could read it. Here's what I mean by that. They're short chapters. Most guys never read another book after they get out of high school. This one's filled with 40 short chapters that you can knock out in 40 days. Read this as a family. Read this by yourself. Give it to someone in your life. And you can pick this up on Amazon right now, pre-ordering it, and it releases on May 21st. And then we'll have companion studies for you on the podcast starting the last part of May. So keep an ear out for that and an eye out for that as well. Looking forward to have you read Friend of God, Letting Jesus Say Who You Really Are. Well, Kevin Burrell, thank you so much for being back on the podcast. At the time we're recording this, we're winding down in spring training, getting ready for the beginning of the season. So uh, for our new listeners, um, tell everybody just who you are in a nutshell and what it is you do. Well, I'm a, uh, my name is Kevin Burrell, and uh, I'm an area scouting supervisor for the Chicago White Sox. I cover uh, the state of Georgia, South Carolina, and Jacksonville, Florida. And um, this is my 33rd year in scouting. And um, yeah, so it's uh, it's always been a been a fun fun time, and it's a grind as well. So uh, just keeping the pedal to the metal, certainly during the scouting season. 33 years, my goodness, you have seen a lot of changes in the game of baseball. I mean, that's living through the steroid era uh, and all the craziness of that and the rule changes over the last few years. I'm curious, uh, when you look at players today versus what you would look for back then, I mean, obviously you're looking for the, the, the five tool basics, but is there anything that you're looking at differently now? Has analytics changed all that? Or when you go out to a high school baseball park, do you still look for the same things? Yeah, I, I think as a scout, you're always trying to scout in the utopia. So you're still evaluating those five tools, the hit and power, run, throw, and field. Um, however, the analytics and the indoctrination of analytics now today, it, it really adds a different piece to it. Um, I've learned over the years um, more analytics, and it's been it's been a good thing. It's been a, a valuable thing to learn, um, mm-hmm. but it's not a um, be all end all to the evaluation of scouting. It's just another piece of it. Mm-hmm. So um, our organization, um, which is a good thing, they they really ask us scouts to you know not lose the evaluation with the eyes. Um, but the uh, analytics do come into play and they enhance, um, you know, the three legs of a player and uh, just, you know, what type of makeup a kid has, his competitiveness, how the numbers and the analytics line up, and then how his physical tools line up. So those three legs are really important in the total evaluation of the player. You know, I heard somebody say one time when 
I think it was Marty Lamb on this podcast. He says, I tend to watch them more in the dugout than I even do on the field. I want to know how they interact with their, you know, players and uh, their teammates, coaches and all that. So what, is that is that true for you as well? Is there is there anything that you're looking for that beyond just how they perform on the field? It is. It's, um, you know, when I met with a player and I'm going back a few years, I met with a player during the offseason and he was a prospect I had interest in. And, uh, you know, I go over a list of about 40 questions with these guys and mm. meet with them either face to face or through video. And uh, in evaluating um, this one particular prospect, he was a pitcher. And um, so uh, he came off the field and, um, you know, he was um, obviously tired and, and had been had been pitching quite a quite a time out there already. But this guy. um uh, went over to the, I watched him in the dugout. He went over to the cooler, the water cooler, and he poured a glass of water and had a towel and he walked it down to the end of the bench to one of his teammates that had just came off the field, an infielder. And mm-hmm. he gave that infielder a cup of water and a towel. And that told me right there a lot about what type of teammate this young man was. Wow. Um, and big. what type of heart he had to serve his teammates, um, that it wasn't just about himself because naturally he was tired and he was hot and sweaty. Um, somebody should have been serving him, but he flipped the script and walked down to the end of the dugout and brought that guy a cup of water and a towel to, uh, to help his teammate. Mm, that's great. Well, I know that you, um, you work with a lot of Christian athletes. You work with a lot of Christian coaches and managers. You're part of some great uh, uh, Zoom call Bible studies with a bunch of managers and scouts and just great guys. Is there a way you encourage uh, an athlete that might be different than the way you encourage somebody perhaps at, uh, at a different type of job? Uh, are there texts that you send to each other? Are there verses you share with each other that – uh, encourage an athlete or a coach. I'm just thinking about the the, the people out there that are Christians that are, uh, you know, coaching a, a little league team or even a high school uh, uh, baseball team or even another sport. You know, is there certain things that you've found, boy, this really helps them and encourages them in their faith and in their, their practice? Um, when these players, the athletes, that is, um, you know, they, they have a lot – uh, to what they're facing nowadays, especially these high profile guys with social media and uh, so many publications and uh, everything is, you know, finally evaluated and looked at and uh, nitpicked over. And so, you know, if I know the player and I know him well and, and know his background with his faith and uh, have a good relationship with him, um, you know, maybe he had a tough game. Maybe he had a tough game on the mound or at the plate. So, I will certainly um, text them uh, or even sometimes call them and just offer a word of encouragement to them to just keep grinding forward. Mm -hmm. Um, Hey, Roger Clemens had bad games and Nolan Ryan had bad games. So they're destined to have bad games. So um, I just try to try to, sometimes I've left them, I prayed with them, you know, especially the guys that I know them well, you know, I prayed for them and um, it's very appreciated on their, on their side. So, um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a time because we live in this society now where um, these guys are under a bubble and, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're they're trying to make progress, not live in this perfect world. And so. Uh, um, so, yeah, I just try to help them and encourage them, especially if I know them well. I think we forget that sometimes um, in many cases, these players that you're dealing with are young adults. They're in their early to late 20s. Um, they're dealing with all the kind of things that an average 25 year old's dealing with, with the added uh, pressure of making millions of dollars or the desire to make millions of dollars or to make a roster or, you know, perform well and social media on top of that and constantly being scrutinized. Uh, all the mental health statistics tell us that people are getting more and more uh, nervous, anxious, depressed. Uh, do you see that in your line of work as well? And are there things that are helpful for players, whether it's, hey, get off of social media or don't read the press, as they used to say, 
um, that, that kind of uh, help an athlete kind of get out of their own way? Yeah, I see a lot of that nowadays, um, especially in the culture we live in um, with these guys. And so these young high school athletes or even um, college athletes, they're just their kids. Mm-hmm. And so they're 17, 18, 19 year old high school kids. And, you know, in college, they're 21 and 22 years old, 23 years old. So um, but they live in this bubble. They live with a microscope on them and especially the more high profile guys. Uh, the money's so big now. And um, it's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot what they have to endure and what they have to process. So mm-hmm. um, I, I always I don't know. I just take the. I take the approach to them that, look, you're just human, man. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. I, I'm on your side. I'm, I'm pulling for you. You got, you know, at least one scout that's, that's there for you to try to help you. I'm always here for you if you need me and just try to approach it that way. Hmm. What a great, what a great piece of advice uh, for all of our coaches out there helping, uh, you know, young kids uh, just play the game. Hey, let me interrupt for just a moment. Did you know we have a YouTube channel? In fact, all of our podcasts are now recorded and placed on YouTube as well. So ever wanted to look at the person I'm talking to? Now you can. Go to Pastor Rusty George on YouTube and subscribe. All right, back to our show. Uh, okay, let me ask you this, because there are people out there that are, are Christians and they're, they're coaching a baseball team or they're even leading at work um, in a normal nine to five job. And they're Christians, but they would love to share their faith with coworkers, or in, in your case, with fellow athletes that aren't Christians. But it kind of gets into a uh, an interesting area there. How do you encourage managers or even players to share their faith with others without overstepping their bounds? Well, I'll just take my profession. So with coaches, um, you know, I, I felt like a few years ago, a handful of years ago, um, there was a real need for um, coaches to be able to leverage their influence as a yeah. coach. And so um, because as Billy Graham, I think, once said, you know, a coach is going to influence more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime. Yeah. So they have a great amount of influence. Um they, they really, a lot of them don't know how to leverage that influence. They don't know um, the power of their influence. So, um, you know, there was a need, I felt like, some years ago, about five years ago. And so basically myself and a, another pastor um, and a couple guys, we just started an online Zoom weekly Bible study uh, discussion, discipleship group, really, for coaches, mm-hmm. baseball coaches. And um you know, we started with just a handful of guys, of four or five guys, and then uh, you know it's it's developed into ninety-five to hundred guys every week that are on here, and so you know we try to teach them and train them and help them develop these skills to be able to live out their faith and be able to share Christ and be able to um, uh, be bold about it, you know, and mm-hmm. um, uh, live it out. How to live it out. You know, what are what are some what are some steps to that? What does that look like for them as a coach? So. um, So, yeah, it's it's really important that, you know, and I we challenge these guys to do that, you know, as as an influential coach. Have there been some coaches in your past or even some maybe some books that you've read or some people that you've learned from that you don't even know that have influenced you over the years that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, um, not too many, honestly, quite honestly, not too many Christian coaches um, that I've mm. that I've really had um, that really took that step or that took that stand. Um, I will say there was a book that I read um, several years ago, um, and it was it was it's a power one of the best leadership books I've read. It was called um, "Leading for God's Sake." Lead for God's sake. Oh, that's a great so book. Yeah, it is a great book. Um, uh, just really about the, the heart of a coach, what that should look like. Do you coach with the heart or do you coach with a hatchet mm-hmm. and, um, you know, how you lead. So, um, that was, that was a really, really good book, um, just to read and go through. Um, but really I, I, for me personally, I, I didn't really understand the influence I had as a, as a scout, um, until I, 
really learn how to be become a disciple, quite honestly. Um, mm-hmm. I I knew that I knew that being a disciple was important. I had no idea how to be one. And so uh, I never understood how to make a disciple. Um, I, and so when I when I finally grasped and understood that, you know, I am I am just a scout. That's what I am. It's what I do. But I'm I'm a minister in disguise as a scout. That's the way I try to put it. Hmm. And so I try to teach these coaches or even teach these athletes that, look, you're if you're a Christian, you're you're a minister first in disguise as an athlete or in the size as a coach. Mm-hmm. That's what you do. And how you leverage that and how you um, your methodology of implementing that and being an influence to others around you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different ways to that. There's different methods to that. But at the end of the day, that's what you are. You're a you're a kingdom building coach or you're a kingdom building athlete. Mm-hmm. And um, so for me, that's that was a big turning point in my life um, uh, personally for me, because I, I really never understood how to be how to be a disciple. I knew it was important to be a disciple. I didn't know how to. Mm-hmm. And so um, yeah, that that really helped me in my my personal life. I love that you went there and I'd love to ask you how you would define that, because I think we all we all say similar things when it comes to what a, a disciple is, but I'm always curious to hear how people sum it up because it often helps clarity for a lot of us. When you're explaining to a, a player who's, you know, a person of faith, but yet they're not necessarily living it out. Um, how do you define a disciple? How do you uh, communicate that to somebody, especially uh, uh, somebody in baseball? Yeah. So, um, for me, the way I the way I define it is simply the fruits of the spirit. So, hmm. um, good. talking about the character of Christ, the character of Christ was the nine fruits of the spirit. So, um, you know, how am I living out my character every day out here? Mm-hmm. Am I showing love? Am I ha- do I have joy? Do I have peace? Do I have gentleness? Do I have kindness? Do I have faithfulness? Do I have self control? I mean, all these fruits of the spirit. Um, that is the character of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so that's the way I like to um, look at myself and I'm evaluating myself daily. Hey, how am I doing in this year? I feel like I got these nine plates spinning and this one down here might be wobbling. This one might be here, here at a high speed. And I need to pay attention to all of those nine plates. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm constantly evaluating myself on those nine fruits of the spirit which are the character of Christ. It was the character of Christ. It is the character of Christ. So, um, and then the, then the conduct of Christ, um, you know, is how he lived his life out. You know, he was a good manager. He was a good steward. He prioritized, um, the message. He prioritized large group and small group. Um, there is, there's so many areas of his life that, that was the con the daily conduct the way he lived out his life. So mm-hmm. I have a grid I keep in my phone um, of these seven attributes of conduct and how am I living those out in my personal life and how am I living those out in my scouting and professional life? Could you share that with us? What's on that grid? Sure. Sure. Um, I love this because I think a lot of us tend to look at, items like you just mentioned, uh, whether it's these seven, uh, conduct checkpoints or even the fruit of the spirit. And we kind of, we kind of look like it, we look at it like it's a, a personality test where we say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, this is who I am, but I'm not these others. In other words, I'm really good with, uh, uh, you know, self-control, but I'm not really good with kindness or whatever. And it's not really kind of a pick and choose thing, right? It's not a, it's not a buffet. It exactly. And, uh, let me pull it up here. So the, this is the way I, I try to, um, can you see me? Okay. I can. No? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the way I, I try to look at it and that just from a, from the conduct of Christ and how am I this grid that I live by. So one is a member. Am I, am I belonging, um, to my local church? Do I belong to a local church? Mm, um, good. do I make that a priority for a second one is a magnifier. Um, and you know, am I, how am I doing in spending time worshiping God in private and in public? 
And um, thirdly, is a minister. Uh, am, I, am I meeting the needs of people in my local community, in my baseball community, and in my local church? Mm. And then the fourth one was is maturing, which is growing. Am I spending time with God, growing in my fellowship, in my faith with him through reading, studying his word, and in prayer? And then the next one is manager, stewardship. Am I meeting, am I managing my time, my calendar, my gifts, my relationships, my treasure, and my temple in a God-honoring way? And then a messenger, uh, which is sharing. Am I seeking out opportunities to share God's message of love and salvation with others, inviting someone to church, uh, to someone to a small group? Uh, how am I doing in the baseball coaches and scouts group? And then the last one is the multiplier, reproduce them. Am I reproducing and multiplying more disciples with the life and time I've been given here on earth? And am I making disciples that make disciples? Mm. So that's the grid that uh, I work from that I believe is that all those, all those conducts, all those priorities were a priority in Jesus' life, a member, a magnifier, a minister, he was maturing, a manager, a messenger, and a multiplier. Those were that was the conduct of Christ, and so I'm I'm constantly trying to look at and evaluate. You know, how am I doing in these areas personally and professionally? Mm, that's a great list. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I'm curious about you know you you deal with a lot of um, you know prospects and kids that want to make it to the show. Uh, want to play baseball for a living. Um, how do you encourage uh, a player to you know, play hard, use the gifts God has given you, maximize your opportunities, but don't make baseball or your career your God? How do you help them kind of develop some wisdom there uh, as you coach them or even give them advice? Yeah. Well, you know, with so many of these guys nowadays, um, and it's rare, especially for these young players nowadays that are amateur guys, the high school kids or the college kids, when, uh, when, when they figure it out, you know, and there's not many that do, not many that do, but um, I, I never, for me, I never try to um, uh, offer that advice unless they ask it. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I just encourage them, look, you know, your family is important. Your time with God is important that your time with God is, is the most important. And I try to share that with them. Your time with your family is a priority. That's so important. Um, this list of baseball at the end of the day, when you're 40 years old, it's not going to make a hill of beans difference. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I try to honestly, help them keep it simple and not get too bogged down in the weeds of it, that, that this game becomes their life. It becomes their identity. It becomes who they are mm -hmm. uh, for good or bad. And so um, I do try to offer them wisdom when they ask, I don't want to just um, lamb blast it with them or, you know, pour it on them if they, if it's not asked. So, um, but yeah, I'm constantly trying to, especially when you have a relationship. Cause I, I believe at the end of the day, ministry and anything we do is built around relationships. It mm -hmm. is all about relationships. And if you don't have a relationship, if I don't have a relationship with a coach or an athlete, it's tough to speak into their life. You know, mm -hmm. it, it really is. It's tough to speak in because you, you have to earn, you have to earn their trust and you have to earn their respect. And uh, that takes time. It takes time. Well, this is, uh, man, this has been really helpful. Even if, you know, our, some of our listeners are not baseball fans, I think that they would certainly get a lot out of just the discipleship side of this. But let's talk a little bit about baseball because uh, uh, you've got a, you know, a new season coming up here. Everybody's optimistic at the beginning of the year. Everybody's zero and zero. And so they feel like we got a shot at this thing. Uh, what are you thinking about the White Sox this year? That's your club. That's who you work with. I mean, how are you feeling? Is this a rebuilding year? Is this a, Hey, we could maybe make a run at uh, you know making the playoffs, or is this a hey we're all in and we're going to win a World Series? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I we've had some we lost a hundred games last year, so um, whenever that happens, there always change, and um, it's been really good change. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it a rebuild. I would say maybe more retool, mm -hmm. and um, 
Um, you know, our, our current general manager, Chris Getz, has come in and done a, a wonderful job uh, thus far in just really implementing a plan for the organization, the direction it's going, um, has really cast good vision. As we know, vision leaks all the time. So mm. he's constantly, um, you know, offering and challenging with vision. And so um, it's, it's, it's been really good. It's been a refresh and a retool. And um, I'm excited about the direction that we're going and, um, you know, what all that looks like in the future. Mm, that's great. Uh, any players we should keep an eye on uh, on the White Sox that, uh, boy, that they're pretty talented, but they might be under the radar? Um, we, have a, we have a young shortstop that's coming up through our system named um, Colson Montgomery. That's a, a really good player. He's a young player. He's a high school draft, former first round pick, and um, he's he's got a chance to be a really special player. And um, it'll be interesting just to see how he develops and how he progresses, um, especially when he gets to the big leagues. You know, there's that fine line. I was talking with a, a former, just another scout uh, the other day that we were just talking about players and you know when to when to bring them up and when not to bring them up. Because that's really important, you know. If you bring a guy up too soon, it could it can impact him negatively. And mm -hmm. uh, and then on the flip side, if you wait too long, it can impact him in a in a negative way. So um, there's a timing mechanism there: when to um, elevate the player, when to call him up, and you know when to to make sure that he's ready to go. You know, mm -hmm. and when he comes up there, he stays up there. Mm. Yeah, it, it is a lot more art than science sometimes, isn't it? Hmm. Yep. Well, listen, Kevin, this has been very uh, encouraging, insightful, uh, and always fun uh, to hang out with you. And I know you're busy. You're on the road right now. You're watching players. You're getting ready for the season. A lot of your work is done in the off season. but uh, I'm just really grateful for you spending some time with us. And I've always appreciated just the way that you uh, carry yourself and the way that you lead. Uh, and you've always been a very big encouragement to me as well. So thank you for being a friend of the show. And uh, I'll cheer for the White Sox as long as they're not playing my Royals. Um, even though we're in the same division, hey, I know what it's like to lose 100 games. So uh, we've been there for a while. Uh, but uh, all the best to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rusty. Have a great day. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. We'll be back next week with brand new content. I want to thank our sponsor for being a part of the show. And I want to thank you for listening. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast, just so you make sure you always get the new content. We're going to bump it up to some daily content coming up here in just a few weeks. So you don't want to miss any of that. So make sure you subscribe now. We'll be back next week. Can't wait to share some great intel with you then and a great guest. We will talk to you then. And as always, keep it simple.